Korea and Canada have concluded negotiations on a bilateral free trade agreement that, once implemented, is expected to significantly boost bilateral trade between the two countries. Now, yesterday's announcement uh, puts an end to nearly a decade of on again, off again talks and marks Ottawa's first free trade foray into the Asia Pacific region. But what's in it for Korea? Well, for a closer look at that question, we are joined live in the studio by Dr. Kim byung ju the head of KLMP Consulting, and of course, our regular commentator on this program. Good afternoon to you, Dr. Kim. Good afternoon. Uh, so the Korea-Canada FTA we mm -hmm. saw yesterday, right. what do you see in the balance sheet? A good deal for Korea, a fair deal for both countries, hopefully? I have to say it's a fair deal for both sides here. And what's happening is, as you mentioned, it's almost like a decade old. To be exact, it's eight years and eight months since it started in January or July 2005. Of course, both sides were not exactly on at the uh, negotiation table. As you mentioned, uh, there was a long break uh, because of Korea's reaction to the mad cow disease to Canadian beef, and there was a WTO process going on. And so uh, Canada was upset about that, so the negotiation was not going on for quite some time. But, you know, just adding up the whole period from the start to the end yesterday, uh, it, I think in my recollection was the longest negotiation that has ever taken place among the 12 FTAs that Korea has signed with its uh, economic partners so far. And uh, Canada is a very important one because it's the world's 11th largest economy. So this is indeed meaningful. And in terms of the gains and all that, as you can see on the screen, this is the overall structure of the trade between Korea and Canada. As you can see, Korea sells a lot of cars to Canada here. And for that, uh, right now, Korean automakers are paying, oh, well, actually the buyers or whoever, uh, both sides. Uh, we are uh, talking about about 6% a tariff, and that will be reduced uh, to 0% in about two years' time. And the, we don't see beef uh, here on the side of the imports from Canada here. And that also is because, as I mentioned, because of the mad cow disease related disputes so far. Actually, uh, what they call cattle and meat category comes in uh, number seven. Uh, the overall amount is about 900,000 US dollars so far. And when uh, this is implemented by 20, 30, year 2030, uh, Canadian beef will uh, enjoy zero tariff. So by then, I think the overall size of the imports uh, in beef items, as well as pork together, will gain a lot. Overall, uh, Canada was quite adamant about like applying the same condition uh, to Canadian beef that was applied to U.S. beef. Mm -hmm. But the uh, Korean side uh, did uh, what they did. What Korean side did was to insist upon applying same kind of condition that we used that we apply to the uh, trade agreement with uh, Australia. So we, uh, because we have had so many FTAs under our belt, uh, Korean government side was using these uh, FTAs that are already in place quite skillfully and very strategically. And I think in that regard, Korea gained a lot in the uh, negotiation process. Now, of course, agriculture is uh, once again a concern here in Korea, as is in almost every case of FTAs that it has signed with. Right. Um, has there been any progress in the way that, that the Korean government is dealing with this uh, perennial dilemma mm. uh, in the latest deal? Not particularly the way I see it. Uh, you know, dealing with the agricultural issues in FTA negotiations, there are different definitions and different ways to evaluate whether the country was successful in negotiation or not. But on the defensive side, uh, taking the side the, of the interest of the farmers, I think Korea did a good job in this uh, in this case of uh, negotiation with Canada because Korea got to defend 211 items, meaning that for 211 items, uh, including uh, rice and ginseng, for instance, uh, Korea is not going to open uh, its uh, you know trade to ca Canadian goods with zero tariffs. Uh, we will have tariffs in place. So 211 items defended means it's a, a great success uh, on the defensive side as compared to 158 items defended in negotiation with Australia and uh, uh, with U.S. only 16 items excluded mm -hmm. from the negotiation. So uh, taking the interest once again for the farmers only, uh, this was a quite a successful negotiation we have to say. But however, of course, the concerns are still there for Korea's cattle growers, especially uh, beef and pork industry here have a big concern because it's not only Canada we are talking about, but also Canada and Australia coming together by the year 2030, where, where 
uh, when we will get to actually see zero tariffs on those uh, beef and pork uh, items coming in from those two countries. So indeed, it will be a big challenge by that time, year 2030. But then again, we have this fresh memory of agricultural interest uh, crying out loud at the beginning of the conclusion of the FTA, but at the end, uh, not much of the negative loss uh, there. I mean, mm -hmm. remember the uh, grape growers uh, in the case of uh, Korea Chile FTA? Right. Actually, Korean grape growers have grown big time, almost uh, doubled its size for the past about 10 years since uh, Ch Korea Chile FTA came into place. And also, I think Hanu uh, you know, makers in, in Korea, Korean beef, have gained a lot since the FTA er era overall began, unlike what they cried out at mm -hmm. the beginning. So indeed, uh, we'll have to wait and see. And uh, this could be a, actually another opportunity for Korean agricultural industry to take a next step upwards. So, um, you know, pretty much uh, they were premature concerns mm -hmm. to begin with, and, and I and suppose... And political, too. Yeah, and political as right, well. Right. Um, now, Korea is one of the global leaders in this FTA drive, mm -hmm. and um, like you said, Canada becomes Korea's uh, 12th bilateral trade uh, right. or FTA mm -hmm. partner. Mm -hmm. Now, with that agreement with Canada, Korea now covers 62% of the global economy. Right. That's a whole a lot, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, the significance of this. Mm, right. 62%, when we say that it's in terms of the GDP figures, if we add up all of Korea's FTA partners and their GDPs together, they come uh, down to 62% of world's GDP as of the year 2012 standard and uh, uh, IMF statistics. And these are 12 FTAs, as I said. And if you count all the countries that are in uh, with these 12 FTAs with Korea, it comes down to 46 countries. So that's a lot of countries we are talking about. Let's bring up a map that will tell us some interesting stories and offer us some uh, interesting numbers here on the screen. Of course, EU is the largest one. Uh, there we have about 105 billion US dollars worth of trade being conducted. The United States is another big one. ASEAN, uh, another big one. Well, actually ASEAN is a very big one right there, as you can see on the screen. So all 12 in order, as you can see, and there are some others uh, coming in the way. Canada and Australia are coming in the way as well. And uh, now uh, after that, of course, we are looking at China and Japan as the next frontier, if you will, or uh, end of the frontier that Korea has been cruising for the last about 10 years. Right. And soon it looks like it will become a, uh, a single mm. trading block right. that Korea has a trading with. Right. Um, you just mentioned China and Japan. What mm. can we expect in the negotiation process with China and Japan? Two separate stories. China with China. Korean government is talking about concluding the deal by the end of the year. My own personal opinion is that's an ambitious goal mm -hmm. because with China, we have big stake in defending our agricultural interest uh, against Chinese uh, aggressive exports or competitiveness in a way in the agricultural sector. And on the other hand, if you flip it around, what that means is Korea's manufacturing excellence that could actually threaten Chinese interests. So there are a lot of the talks that needs to be done. And we are being told that this, the pace of it itself has been going reasonably smooth, but we'll have to find out whether everything could be concluded by the end of the year. Uh, I'm uh, watching this with great interest here. And Japan, if we finally include China and Japan, as you mentioned, it's almost pretty much Korea covering all the global economies because China, its size number one, number two in the world, and uh, Japan is number three in the world. Mm -hmm. So pretty much that's the end of the frontier. I don't know how further we can go beyond that point. With Japan, the vehicle is TPP. And with TPP, Korea has been taking 7 plus 3 plus 2 approach. 7, we already have FTAs with 7 economies mm -hmm. of TPP participants. And 3 new ones we wanted to add, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. Now New Zealand is coming in sometime pretty soon. So we will be done by 7 plus 3 stage. And the remaining two are Japan and Mexico. And Korea was going to and will probably go into TPP negotiation with Japan and Mexico without FTA, bilateral FTA mm -hmm. deals. And so the overall st strategy is going ahead. And let's wait and see. Uh, depending on how the TPP is wrapped up, if it can be wrapped up uh, successfully, Japan will be in together with Korea within FTA boundary. All right. Well, uh, Korea's trading uh, strategies with the rest of the world is something that we will be on the lookout for for the uh, rest of the year. Absolutely. All right, Dr. Kim Byung-ju, thank you so much for today. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay.